And so uh, we're going to open our Bibles and we're going to go to Matthew chapter 4. Is where we're going to read just a few verses in Matthew chapter 4 today. Reading from verses 18 to 22. I think it's going to come on the screen here. It says, Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee and he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net. See what I did there? I did a Google search, looked for the word net, found it because I know I was coming to net church. That's how much I love you guys. Not really. Casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. We can leave it there. Jesus finds this man called Simon Peter, calls him out from where he is and says, hey, come follow me. Leave your nut, leave your boat, because I'm going to make you a fisher of men. If there's anything you need to know about Jesus, it's this. Jesus is good at making stuff happen. He has this ability to turn something from nothing into something. It's no surprise if you think his heavenly father had the ability to fling stars and planets into the space. His heavenly father was quite creative. And so he would have been brought up seeing his heavenly father in heaven create this beautiful heavens and earth. And so he would have seen that. And then when he comes down to earth, he then sees his natural father, who is Joseph, take a block of wood and chisel it and make it into a beautiful set of tables and chairs. And so Jesus would have seen stuff being made. So it's no surprise that Jesus, like father, like son, has this same ability to make something out of nothing. Are any of you good at DIY in this place? I am officially the worst, okay? You are a liar, Andrew. Don't be, the Lord is watching today, don't you? And your wife knows, okay? I'm awful at making stuff. I can't, you know, when I go to Ikea and you buy the same set of drawers that you've bought for the last 20 years and you still have difficulty putting them together. And when it comes to cooking, it is not a gift that God has gifted me with. Um, but a few months ago, I decided to cook my wife a beautiful meal on a date night. I was like, leave it to me, babe. I'm going to do this. And in our kitchen, I found this book and it was called Jamie Oliver's Meals in 20 Minutes. Let me tell you something about Jamie Oliver. I love Jamie Oliver. I like his food. I like his TV presentation. I, I, I like him, but you need to know one thing about Jamie Oliver. Jamie Oliver is a liar. He is. There is nothing 20 minute about his meals. It takes 20 minutes to read the recipe and to find out the words on Google of the ingredients he is looking for you to find. It took me two and a half hours to even start making the meal. It ended up costing me over 45 pounds in ingredients to make the meal. I'd worked out that it would have been quicker for me to drive my wife and it would have been cheaper for me to take her to Jamie Oliver's restaurant in Leeds, where he would have made it on our behalf and I would have got home and saved time and saved money. Why? Because Jamie Oliver is a liar. <laughs> but when it comes to making food, I'm not great. I'll tell you what I am good at doing. I am great, really good at making the call to the Indian takeaway. I am blessed at that. But I'm not necessarily gifted at making stuff happen. But if you get around Jesus, you need to know he is good at making you into a better you. And some of you, I believe, have come to this church today and some of you are planted in this church and this is your home church, but maybe some of you are just checking it out and some of you may not have a relationship with Jesus. We want you to know you're so welcome here and that you belong here. But I do want to tell you the more time that you spend around the presence of Jesus, he has this ability to start changing you. He has this ability to start making you into a better you. And I know you can engage in self-help and you can help yourself all you want. But is there anyone else out there with me who sometimes needs some higher help, <laughs> some divine help? Because like I said earlier, I don't have the skills and I don't have the intelligence and I don't always have the strength and I don't always have what it takes. 
but it is God and his spirit working within me that enables me to become all that I can be. And Peter is in a boat fishing for fish. And it is Jesus that calls him out of the boat and says, you're going to go and fish for people. Jesus is saying, you are here, but if you can follow me, I'm going to take you there. And I want to encourage every single one of you today to ask yourself this question. It's the title of this short time that I have with you, speaking with you today. The question I have, you want you to ask is this, who am I becoming? Who am I becoming? I think it's a question all of us have to ask ourselves regularly because many of you are here and you have settled here, but who are you becoming? Some of you think, well, surely this is a message just for young people. No, if you are in your 40s or your 50s, you are in your 60s, you still have to ask yourself the question, who am I becoming? Because the journey is still on for life. You still have breath in your lungs. You can still become more and you can still become all that God has called you to be. Jesus is taking you from here and he is taking you from there. And when Jesus gets involved in your life, let me tell you, he begins to take you somewhere. The making and the shaping of you is ultimately found in the fellowship of Christ. And I've tried lots of times to make it by myself. And I've sometimes tried to shape myself, but I've had to settle that the making and the shaping of me is found in the fellowship of Christ. That's why Jesus says, follow me and I will make you. Sometimes we want to try and make it on our own and we keep hitting a brick wall. We keep going around the cul-de-sac. Why? Because it is only in the fellowship of Christ do we find the makeship of who we are. And sometimes we don't want to do the journey of following Christ. Sometimes we want like a microwave Christianity where we want to put ourselves in a 60 second spin and hopefully we will turn out how we want to turn out. But how many of you know, you've got to put in the hard yards. You've got to put in the time. You've got to become a disciple of Christ if he is going to make you into all that God has called you to be. Because who you are following is crucial. And I speak to young people all the time and you parents in here would know and you young people would know that who you are following is crucial. And even as you are adults, who you follow on social media, who you spend your time with, it is crucial who you spend time with and it is crucial who you follow because who you are following is making you into someone. It is making you into something. Who you follow, you are being shaped by that. Which is why I think Paul the Apostle says, follow me as I follow Christ. He's basically saying, if you can follow me, and if I can commit to following Christ, then hey, we will get to the right place. But if you end up following the wrong person, you will end up in the wrong place. And I want to challenge every teenager in here. Think about who you are following. Are the people that you are following leading you closer to Christ or leading you further from Christ? Because who you are following, whether you like it or not, is making you into somebody. The why the Bible says in the book of Proverbs that he who walks with the wise becomes wise. And so if you want wisdom, you've got to walk with wisdom. But if you never walk with wisdom, you can't expect wisdom to enter your house. You are becoming a product of what you are following. So who I choose to follow, I am ultimately becoming a product of that. Which is why it is so crucial, this conversation in Matthew chapter 4 that we find with Jesus and Peter. Jesus identifies him and says, hey, Peter, I want you. I want you to follow me. And if you follow me, I'm going to make you into something that you never thought was possible. If you can follow that, you can become that. And if you can follow Christ, you can become like Christ. And let's be honest in here. Let's just make it simple. Our life's mission is to become more like Christ. You can, you can have role models and you can have examples and you can see lots of people that you aspire to. But ultimately, if we're going to make a significant difference, we need to become more like Christ. I want to speak like Christ. I want to walk like Christ. And I want to love like Christ. 
It is the continuation, like I said, of Jesus Christ on earth. That is the body of Christ. But if I want to be like Christ, guess what? I've got to follow Christ. But every human being starts off the same. And so I have two sons. I have a six-year-old and I have a two-year-old. He was just two yesterday and he's, he keeps me alive. <laughs> I, when this invitation came, I was like, I'm going. Why? Because I'll get a full night's sleep. But when you start off in those early years, you start, we all start off in the same. We come out of our mother's womb and we all start the process of becoming. I know you're only six months or a year and one and a half years, but you start to walk, you start to crawl, and then you start to walk, and you start to run, and then you start to have personality, and then you start to talk. And we all follow those same, we all follow the same pattern of who we are becoming. And then when you hit sort of four, five, six, I'm starting to ask my sons now, you know, what do you want to do when you are older? And normally you get the same kind of response, which I want to be a fireman, or I want to be an astronaut, or I want to be an ice cream man. I was actually an ice cream man. That was my first ever job. But I, I got fired after three months because I kept going around some of the poorer communities and giving away free ice cream. Um, and they would come and they'd say, it's a pound for 99. And they'd be like, how much have you got? And they're like, I've got 5p. I'm like, no problem. Here you go. And then how many of you know the word caught on? <laughs> that we found the cheapest ice cream man in the UK. You can get an ice cream with a flake for 5p, which satisfied the customers but didn't satisfy the boss. You can ask you what you want to do at those ages, but you never find a five-year-old and say, you know, what do you want to do? And say, I want to be an accountant. I want to be a surveyor. You know, I want to be a barrister. You don't really find that. They sort of want to engage in sort of like more sort of like fun jobs. If you ask teenagers now, what do you want to do when you're older? They'll, I want to be a professional gamer. I want to be a YouTube star. I want to be a socialite. I want my life to be on E every single night. Or I want to be a student. I'm like, we've got plenty of them. Okay. What do you want to do? We start this process of what are you going to do? And it's the early formative years. And if you've been in church any time, sometimes you, you, you call it this word, and it's quite a Christian word. And the word is destiny. Okay. I don't know anyone else who uses the word destiny quite like the church uses. We love to speak about it. even sounds good, doesn't it? Destiny. Just sounds spiritual. And uh, most churches have a dance group called Destiny Dance. Um, but sometimes we speak about destiny, but you're like, I don't actually know what it means. It's like a very Christianese kind of word. It's kind of like a church word. But destiny simply, it's the destination of who you are becoming. So if we want to speak into the destiny of Net Church, what am I speaking into? The destination of who you are becoming as a church the locations that you have and the vision that you have and the plans that you have. If I speak into the destiny of your family, what does it look like? I mean, where we want to do, what we want to achieve, what we want to be and where we're going. It is the destination of where you are going. But so often in life, when we speak to young people or we speak about that, we all base it in what do you want to do? How many of you know that? It's all based in what do I want to do with my life? Where do I want to live and, and what am I going to do? And we, we focus on the doing. And, and sure, there is an importance to the doing. But I think the bigger question we have to ask ourselves this question today is, is not, do I, what, not what do I want to do, but who do I want to be? If you can focus on your being, it will always open doors for your doing. But so often we find people who are so focused on, on this is what I want to do, but they don't necessarily have the character to become what they want to do. You've got to have the character in your being before you can ever fulfill it in your doing. And I think the bigger question to ask is, what do I want to be? And so Simon Peter, fishing is what he does, and he's good at it. And I'm sure his parents have done it, and his grandparents have done it, and there's a legacy in his life of fishing. Fishing is what he does. But yet Jesus is calling him out of the boat. And it's almost like this conversation is more about who Peter is going to become rather than more of what he is going to keep on doing. I'm taking you out of the boat, Peter, to fish. you. That's what you've been doing. But you're going to become an instrument for me. You're going to become a fisher for me. You're going to become something different than what you think your life was all about. If I was Simon Peter in that situation, 
and Jesus comes to me and says, come follow me, I would respond and go, well, I need a job description. I would respond and say, well, I need a job brief. I need some roles and responsibilities before I make a decision to step out of this boat and leave the comfort of my salary and leave the comfort and the familiarity of what I've always known. I'm not just going to leave. I need to know some stuff. If I was Simon Peter, I'd be asking Jesus those questions. But Jesus doesn't give job descriptions. Jesus just gives character descriptions. And he says, if you can become this, then you'll be able to do that. The Bible says immediately Simon Peter leaves the boat and begins to follow Jesus. Why? Because who you become is so much more important than what you do. And your being will always create opportunity for your doing. And I encourage you, no matter what stage you are at in your life, continually work on your character. I've just turned 37 years old. Uh, I know I'm half the age of Roy, um, nearly. I, I feel like friends here. It's called banter. But I'm still trying to work on who I am. I'm still trying to work on my being. I'm still trying to work on my character because I want to become a better husband, if I'm honest. I want to become a better father to my kids. I want to become a better leader for our church. I want to become a better friend. I want to become a better neighbor. And I can't just settle with who I am. I've got to commit to the process of who I can become. And I focus more on what I'm going to become more than what I'm going to do. But I do often wonder this. If you think about the life of Jesus, have have you ever wondered this? Why did he leave it 30 years Till the Bible says he started his ministry. I'm like, Jesus, that's bad time management. I'm like, you could have fulfilled so much more in your time had you started at 22. You'd have got another extra eight years of ministry. Think how many more blind eyes you could have opened. Think how many more dead bodies you could have raised. Think how many more sermons you could have preached. Jesus, like, you need to handle your time a little bit better. But then if you do some study into Judaic culture, you find out that the age of 30 was regarded the age of spiritual maturity. So in Judaic culture, you were not regarded as spiritually mature enough to lead or to serve in the temple until you were at the age of 30. It was a significant age. And then you do some more digging and you find Joseph when he becomes the prime minister of Egypt under Pharaoh. Guess how old he was? The Bible says he was 30 years old. Then you find David, who is anointed to become the king of Israel when he's a lot younger, but he finally becomes the king of Israel. Guess how old he is? 30 years old. Then you find the ministry of John the Baptist, which co alongside Jesus. He was also 30 years old. Jesus starts his ministry at 30. He begins to, okay, there's something significant here. Because there was almost something that took place in all of those men's lives in their early years. Something of destiny that gave birth in Joseph. Something of destiny and anointing that gave birth in David. Something definitely in Jesus and John the Baptist. But yet for each of them, they waited years for it to develop and become what it needed to become. I sometimes think with the life of Jesus, why did he wait 30? And then, you know, the Bible says that he turned water into wine was the first miracle he does. And his mom says, come on, Jesus, you can turn the water into wine. And Jesus, now my time has not yet come. I wouldn't base your theology on this. I wouldn't base you build your life on this. This is my own Dave Niblock theology. I'm thinking he was 29 and I think it was the eve of his birthday. And I think it was 11.45 at night. And I think everyone was having a good time and the clock was going. Jesus, Jesus, like, I can't do it, mom. I can't do it. I'm like, boom. Yeah. <laughs> he waited till he was 30. Why? Because there was something in all of those guys that understood I can't be fully recognized as a rabbi until I'm 30. I can't teach the scribes until I'm 30. Why? Because something is developing in me. Something is happening in me. And if you're 22 in here, or if you're 28 in here, or if you're 30 in here, maybe God is about to do something with your life. And I know we're not no longer bound by our age. And we young people can 
heal the blind and young people can preach the word of God and teenagers and young adults can lead great movements. I know we're not restricted by age, but there is something in the Judaic culture, which is what I like, which is basically saying destiny has given birth in us at an early age, but yet it's taking years to become what it needs to become. It is waiting. It is percolating. It is developing into something. And we can respond by, by saying, yeah, but I'm ready to heal now. And Jesus could have said, I want, I'm ready to heal now. I'm ready to lead now. And I'm ready to preach now. But there is something that God says and he goes, wait. But let me add it, wait. But I want to start a church now, wait. I, I, I'm ready to preach, wait. Because in the waiting, God is preparing you. He is developing you because your fellowship of Christ leaving the boat is making you into something that you need to become if you are going to fulfill what God has called you to fulfill. Our generation is a now generation. We want it now. We want a big church now. We want to heal now. We want to be able to lead now. We want a successful business now. I want a big house now. And I need that phone now. And I want that car now. And I want that girlfriend now. But if we can understand the one thing, that every day is producing something in me. That every day, March 29, is producing something in me. June 2019, September 20, every day it is producing something in me for who I am becoming. Maybe if we understand that, maybe we won't get so angry at God for the job that we have at 21, for the house that we live in at 25. Maybe we won't get angry at God that we're not married and have a pet dog at the age of 19, but we would understand God is working within us. He's developing in us. And if Jesus can wait 30 years, then I'm happy to wait a few more years because he's developing something in me of who I can become. I am becoming something. And if I can keep following Jesus, I know that he can make me into something that I'm currently not. But don't step out too early. Don't leave too early. Don't check out too soon. Why? Because the developing in you is developing in you who you need to become. But the problem with Peter and the problem with me and you it is what I call the clash. It is the clash of who you are right now and who you are becoming. It is this clash of this is who I am, Dave Niblock, 37, June the 9th, 2019. And all the days that I've lived have made me who I am right now. The last six weeks haven't made me who I am right now. The last 37 years have made me who I am right now. I can't blame Brexit. I can't blame a whole heap of things. Who I am right now is a result of my choices in my life from 37 years. But we have to live within the clash of who I am right now and who I believe God is calling me to be. And who I believe God is calling me to be, I don't feel like I've fulfilled that. I don't feel I've reached the potential of that. I still feel it's a long way over there. And I prophesy into this church right now that net church is who you have become right now. But there is so much more vision and there is so much more that God is calling you to do. So much more impact. But it is over there. But we live in this clash of who I am, but who we want to be. And how do we live in that place of who I am and who I want to be? Because you see, life doesn't stop. And the best thing you can do is just to keep moving. You can't just stop because that is not going to come closer to you. You have to go closer to it. The vision isn't going to go, okay, well, you know what? If you're not prepared to give and if you're not prepared to serve and if you're not prepared to turn up and if you're not prepared to do, don't worry, then we'll just come to you. No, it is all on our end where we have to make a decision to sacrifice and to give and to serve and to become a disciple of Christ. And as I become a disciple of Christ, we will move closer to that vision. Life doesn't stop. It keeps moving. No matter what age you are, something is happening in you. Your business is becoming something. Your marriage, if you've been married 25 years, your marriage can still become something. 
Don't settle for where it's at. Don't just think, well, what it is now is what it's always going to be. No, may there be a vision for your marriage and a vision for your family and a vision for your business and a vision for your church. Life keeps moving. Why? Because whatever model you are right now, there is a better model in you somewhere. Let's put it like this. Whatever software system is operating your life right now, there is always an upgrade available to you. Whatever iOS, oh, the Apple lovers love that. The Android people are like, what's that? What's that? I'm a Samsung man. Um, whatever software system is in you, there is always a better software system waiting for you to download. Here's something funny. My mum, Keely was talking about my mum and dad. They are legends. They're amazing, my mum and dad. Marjorie and Brian. And uh, apparently Roy has been calling me Brian for the last few weeks. But uh, that's all good. Um, but my mum still uses as her phone the original iPhone. And it's not even got a number on it. Not the iPhone 4 or 5, 6. It's just the iPhone, Okay. She uses it as her phone. Recently, she took it into the Apple store because there was a problem with it. Surprise, surprise. And she takes it into the store. Apparently, all these guys in blue t-shirts from the Apple shop gather around like they found like a fossil. It's literally like a dinosaur bone has been found in the Apple store. Wow, amazing. All these Apple geeks going, wow, 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 wow. Android people walking by going, no, thank you. Oh, swarming around this phone. It's like my mum was like a celebrity in this place. Wow, you use this. My mum was going to give it away to, my mum's so kind. She just gives it, you know, she was going to give it away. My mum, do not give it away. I want to be generous, but not that generous. Because it's worth 1,500 pounds. The original iPhone is worth 1,500 pounds. Some of you are going to start spending this afternoon searching for it in the boxes of your house somewhere. You know you are. Some of you, how was church? It was all right, but I'm looking for my iPhone. What did Dave Niblock speak on? I don't know, but I'm looking for my iPhone. Did the Holy Spirit fall? I have no idea, but where is that phone? Anyway, I say to my mum, I'm like, it's good that you use it. Because she goes, you know what her response? I'm like, why do you still use it? And her response is this. It's fine. It does what I need it to do. And it's a very noble response. <laughs> but actually, there's a flaw with that response. You see, in Apple, when they made the iPhone, they knew there was a better iPhone in them. They knew there was a better camera in them. They knew there were better software. They knew there were better apps. When they made iPhone 7, they knew there was an 8 in them. When they made the 8, they knew there was an X in them and whatever comes next. And whether you're like, yeah, but I'm not into technology, that's all good. But I'm trying to help you understand the point that there is something in the company of Apple that I believe should be in the company of the church that says no matter what model we are, there is always a better model in us somewhere. And in our family, there is always a better model. Don't just settle. Don't just settle for, it's fine. How's your life? It's fine. How's your marriage? It's fine. How's your church? It's fine. God has called us for more than fine. God has called us to be innovative. God has called us to develop. God has called us to get out of the boat and follow him. That's why the Bible says in Corinthians that God has called us what from glory to glory. Here's the good thing I like. How many of you know glory is good? <laughs> I'm happy with the glory I've got, but he doesn't stop there. He says from glory to an ever increasing glory. But the glory of God's good. But when you're walking with God, there is always more. Who are you becoming? Jesus says, walk with me. Peter is fishing over here, but his life is about to be transformed. Jesus prophesies into his life. He speaks life into this man who most scholars believe probably failed the Jewish exams and so had to resort to fishing because he wasn't successful enough to continue in the Jewish law. And Jesus finds him and speaks life and prophesies life and says, you might be a fisher, but I can see something in you. Can I encourage this church to breathe and speak life into the people into this church? Speak life into your young people. Speak life into your young adults. Speak life into your family. Speak life and say, hey, this might be who you are right now, but you can become so much more. And Peter's like, nobody's ever told me that. 
He speaks life into his future. Don't be negative. Don't be cynical. Don't be small-minded about your future. It's not about more stuff. It's about greater purpose. Because ultimately, you have to be open to the process of change. If you want to become all that God has called you to become, you have to be open. And you have to open your life to the process of change. Change isn't an event. Change is a process. This church will not change overnight. This church is a process. You don't get fit overnight. It is a process. You don't lose weight overnight. You wish you could, but losing weight is not an event. It is a process. It's, it, it change doesn't just happen. You have to commit to change. And it is the process that brings the change for who you are becoming. And if we cannot commit to the process of change, we will never become all that God has called us to be. You see, when Jesus calls his disciples, the root word of that is the discipline. If you want to be a disciple, it's a lot of discipline. If you want to be a disciple of Jesus, which he calls us to, it's basically following him wholeheartedly. It's the life living a discipleship is the followership, which leads to the makeship. But sometimes some of us want to be made without being followed. And we're not followers because we're not disciples. You have to be open to the process of change. And you have the current state of change. You then have the transitional state of change. You have the future state of change. I haven't got into, I haven't got time to go into those things, but all of us are changing. And the Bible says that Jesus calls him out of the boat and immediately Peter leaves the boat and follows him. And if you want to be a radical follower of Jesus, sometimes you have to leave some boats. Sometimes you have to leave the familiar, you have to leave the predictable, you have to leave what you know, not fully knowing what is where he's going to. But you see, Jesus has been watching, and sometimes people go, sometimes when Jesus chose his disciples, some people, I think some people think Jesus went, uh, you. I don't think Jesus was as random as that. I believe Jesus had been sat down on that bay watching for a few weeks. And he'd seen this man come early, Peter, and he'd see him leave late. He'd see everyone else leave. And he'd see Peter wash out the boat. And he'd see Peter bring in the fish. And he would see there was something on his life. I don't just think it was a random appointment. I think he'd been observing him. And I think if he can, if he can do that, and I can, I can do something with this guy. And I think over time, Jesus says, hey, I've spotted you. Come follow me. I'm going to make you into a fisher of men. See, Jesus knew what Simon Peter had. And Jesus knows what you have. You see, all the raw ingredients of the future Peter were already in the current Peter. All the raw ingredients of who you can become, guess what? They are in you right now. They are in you right now. You have what it takes. That's why Peter, in one of his books, he writes, we have been given everything we need for life and godliness. And I didn't know it was in me but as soon as I get around Jesus, what is in me, guess what, begins to come out of me. And Peter transitions in these three years with Jesus. And it's not easy walking with Jesus. Sometimes people think walking with Jesus is the easiest thing. Hey, man, yeah, let's chill. Let's have another Starbucks. I'm with Jesus. No, with Jesus, it's like sometimes a hostile environment. Because what I want to say, I can't say that I'm with Jesus. Where I want to go, I don't do that. I don't go there because I'm with Jesus. And Peter was in this place and he had to deal with the change of culture and he had to deal with Jesus confronting him. He had to deal with Jesus challenging him. But part of it was pick up your cross and follow me. Jesus sets the bar high, but Simon Peter says, hey, I'm going to follow you. But what I love about Simon Peter is he made mistake after mistake. He chopped off an ear once. He rebuked Jesus. Not a good thing to do. He denied Jesus three times. Mistake after mistake, issue after issue. But what I love about Jesus and what I love about Jesus with all of his disciples, he never sacked any of his disciples. One of them voluntarily resigned. But the rest of them Jesus was committed to. Why? Because Jesus is more committed to your becoming than you are. He's more committed to you becoming all that you can be than you will ever be committed to yourself. And in this pivotal moment, as the band come and join me, we've got to close. But in this pivotal moment, many of you know it, Jesus is having a conversation with Peter. And Jesus says, hey, Peter, who, who do people say I am? And Simon Peter says, well, some say this and some say that. But Jesus says, but who do you say I am? And Simon Peter says, you are the Christ. You're the son of the living God. 
Jesus replies, now you know that because that has been revealed to you by the Father. I'm going to tell you who you really are. You see, Simon was always known as Simon. The world would have known him as this weed, easily swayed, man who made mistakes and not perfect and just a little bit lacking in areas. And that's who, who he was. But Jesus said, I'm going to call something out of you. Because you know who I am, I'm going to tell you who you really are. Why? Because the discovery of your identity will always be found in your discovery of Christ. You will never know who you are until you know who Jesus is. And it is only in the discovery and the revelation of who Jesus is that Jesus began to speak to him and said, you're not Simon, you're Peter, you're a rock. And as you follow me, I'm going to take you from Simon and I'm going to lead you to become a Peter. But it's going to take a few years and you're going to have to take off those earthly labels that say you're easily swayed, that says you're a bit wet, that says you're a bit weak, that says you're a bit nothing. I'm going to take them off you and I'm going to put some heavenly labels on you. I'm going to tell you who you really are, which is why I think Peter, in the book that he writes in the New Testament, he says, we are a chosen people. We are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. I am God's special possession. Why? Because Simon Peter has discovered who he is. And Peter, on this three-year journey, becomes this evangelist. He becomes this church builder. He becomes this New Testament writer. He becomes this apostle. The Bible says that Simon Peter became so anointed that people would put the sick on the side of the streets that even his shadow might touch them and heal them. Look how far Peter has come. Look how he has changed. Look who he has become. This young man, as I finish, this young man in a fishing boat in Matthew chapter 4 follows Jesus and in Acts chapter 2 stands up, raises his voice, preaches one of the greatest messages ever heard. And the Bible says about 3,000 accepted his message. Why was it about? Because the connections team ran out of cards. <laughs> about 3,000 accepted his message. From Matthew chapter 4 to Acts chapter 2. It is the walking with Jesus that has enabled him to become who God had already called him to become. You see, the Acts chapter 2 Peter was always in the Matthew chapter 4 Peter. But he needed to be with Jesus to get it out of him. And I believe for this church, you might be in a Matthew chapter 4 kind of moment. But God is calling you to an Acts chapter 2 kind of church. And you can't give up on your becoming. You can't quit on your becoming. Why? Because there are miracles in your becoming. There is salvation. There is breakthrough. There is life transforming power in your becoming. Because who you are becoming doesn't just matter for you. People are relying on you. Your church, your family, your friends are relying on you. The next level of this church is not found in a new building. The next level of this church is found in your becoming. You've got to open your life to what God wants you to become and say, I'm going to get out of the boat and I'm going to follow him. Question, who are you becoming? Because there is an Acts chapter 2 within you. Don't settle for Matthew chapter 4. Allow the Acts chapter 2 to start coming out in Jesus' name. Amen.